Good day, and today is the 1st of December 2022, and you are watching Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. I'm your host, Rondell Dono, attorney at law once again. I'm happy to bring the law and you. Of course, today we must commemorate World AIDS Day, and of course, the theme this year is equalized, and we must pay homage to persons who would have lost their life to this deadly disease well. It's, it's no longer deadly, however, it's important that you get tested, it's important that you know your status, practice abstinence, as well as use contraceptives, etc. And of course, um, it's no, I mean, it's no doubt that we are speaking today about medical, um, and medical area which intertwines with law, and this is relation to forensic pathology and the criminal justice system. And I am very honored, of course, uh, to have an international guest I should say, a renowned um, forensic pathologist uh, by the name of Dr. Alfredo Eugene Walker. Um, there's a lot of letters after the name, but I won't say all the letters, but of course he is the vice chair and director of education at the Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine in the Faculty of Medical or Medicine in the University of Ottawa. Just a bit about um, Dr. Walker. Uh, he has been, he has held the position of um, forensic pathologists uh, for the past 11 years at the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service, um, which is based within the Eastern Ontario Regional Forensic Pathology Unit at the Ottawa Hospital General Campus. Now, Dr. Walker is a medical graduate of the School of Medicine, Faculty of Med Medical Sciences at the University of the West Indies in St. Augustine Campus, uh, Trinidad and Tobago. He has completed both residency in uh, anatomical pathology and a fellowship in forensic pathology in the United Kingdom. Over the years, he has mentored several students who have an interest in atom uh, atomical pathology and or forensic pathology. He was instrumental in the establishment of the Pathology Club of the, United, of the University of the West Indies in August 2020 and conceptualized and implemented Caribbean Pathology and Laboratory Medical Student Initiatives of the University of Ottawa uh, to support these needs. Now, Dr. Walker is a very active author uh, who has written four chapters to date in forensic pathology textbooks and several articles in academic journals. He has been in, an invited speaker at many of international conferences, including the recently concluding conference uh, in Trinidad and Tobago with respect to uh, the sixth Caribbean uh, Medical Legal and Forensic Symposium, which was entitled Courtroom Examination of Bodies of Evidence, Trials and Errors, uh, which took place in November 18th and 19th in 2022. I know it's a lot of information, there's a lot of medical terms. Of course, he's a proud son of the soil doing amazing work in the international stage, and he's giving back, and he has continued to give back to our local jurisprudence. Um, of course, he is joining us via uh, Zoom, so let me put him on screen and welcome Dr. Walker, how are you? Hi, good morning, uh, Mr. Donovan. I am fine. How are you? I am well, I am well, and thank you for joining us on Strict Legal. We are indeed grateful uh, for your presence. Of course, I know you are, you are a very busy person. It's my pleasure to be here. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Indeed. Um, now, uh, I note that this topic is about uh, forensic pathology. Um, and the criminal justice system. Um, so, so let us start with just an overview of what is uh, forensic pathology. So forensic pathology is a subspecialty area of medicine uh, that deals with the investigation of deaths of a medical legal nature. Um, so basically it deals with sudden, unexpected, unexplained, unnatural, or violent deaths. And it is a, a subspecialty area of anatomical pathology. Anatomical pathology deals with the diagnosis of diseases, um, the more so the naked eye changes that they cause in the different organs and systems of the body, as well as the microscopic level. And forensic pathology is a subspecialty area of that in which additionally um, forensic pathologists are trained in injury interpretation as well as the interaction of drugs and toxins um, 
with injuries and natural disease so as to determine the medical cause of death and to advise on the manner of death. Now, you're saying that, um, of course, uh, there is obviously a difference between forensic pathology and anatomical pathology. Can you just give us in terms of what is the difference? So anatomical pathology, uh, as I said, is mainly deal, uh, deals with the diagnosis of disease uh, in uh, persons, uh, be it living or dead. Um, an anatomical pathologist would be someone who examines a biopsy of a lump from a breast, biopsy from an enlarged prostate, uh, biopsy of a colonic tumor, et cetera, um, to determine whether it is cancerous or not, and if it is cancerous, what type of cancer, uh, because the different microscopic types, histological types, can influence treatment. So anatomical pathology, more or less, is deals with the diagnosis of uh, disease uh, and the tissue changes that they cause so as to uh, treat persons. And an anatomical pathologist, more or less, works in a hospital a laboratory, an anatomical pathology laboratory, where a variety of specimens removed from patients, be it biopsies or resection specimens, are sent and those tissues and organs are processed um, to, into microscopic sections, glass slides, which are then looked at under the microscope. Um, as a secondary spin-off, anatomical pathologists would also perform post-mortem examinations in certain types of deaths, the natural deaths, some accidental deaths, some suicides, um, but by and large, the criminally suspicious deaths and, frankly, homicidal deaths uh, should be the purview of uh, a forensic pathologist. And it's important that you mentioned criminal um, suspicious deaths and homicide is really under the purview of forensic pathologists. And, of course, um, it, it, it draws into the question in terms of why is um, a forensic pathologist important, right, in terms of whether it is by virtue of giving evidence um, to suggest, you know, the cause of death or to assist or aid in, in what you call um, the, the crime, the criminal justice system. Uh, yes. So forensic pathologists are supposed to, according to the requirements in North America, in the United States, in Canada, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, and other um, more uh, medical legally advanced jurisdictions should be firstly trained in anatomical pathology and then undergo subspecialty training in forensic pathology. And that additional subspecialty period of training in forensic pathology gives them the necessary uh, exposure, experience, skills to assess injuries, to classify injuries, to assess them, and to become, develop a level of expertise in the effects of injuries as they relate to um, the cause of death, mechanism of death, the manner of death. On top of that as well, you have the effects of drugs and toxins, so illicit drugs of abuse, uh, alcohol, therapeutic drugs, etc. And, and sitting on top of that also would be any underlying significant natural disease, which may or may not have played a part uh, in the death, such as uh, heart disease, uh, etc. So basically, when it comes to determining the medical cause of death in certain categories of death, the forensic pathologist is able to assess the relative contributions of injuries, drugs and toxins, and natural disease to determine to a reasonable degree of medical certainty the medical cause of death. And, of course, does that mean now that a forensic pathologist is... Uh, uh, his role is fundamental when it comes to giving now evidence, because obviously you know the cause of death. But when now it comes to, to giving that evidence in the courtroom, um, is it that you need special training, or is it that it's a matter of just using your, um, your advice as a, prof as a medical professional to give that type of evidence in, in, in the court? So the end result of what we do in forensic pathology is the preparation 
of a medical legal report, a post-mortem examination report, which can be used for a variety of purposes, of which, um, you know, prosecution uh, of a, a criminal matter, uh, be it a charge of murder, manslaughter, uh, et cetera, or um, for, you know, civil litigation purposes, insurance purposes, would be the end result. So therefore, by the mere fact of the end product being used as some form of uh, evidence, we, ha as forensic pathologists, must be trained in navigating the court system. Uh, and most of our interaction would be in the criminal uh, justice system, in the criminal courts. So as part of my training as a forensic pathologist in the United Kingdom, I had to undergo five days uh, mandatory uh, five-day training in expert witness uh, testimony, expert witness training. And this was uh, paid for and sanctioned by the British Home Office. It's one of the mandatory requirements to get on the Home Secretary's register of accredited forensic pathologists who are the only ones who could do criminally suspicious deaths on behalf of the Crown in England and Wales. So, so this is where you are basically given uh, theoretical, um, you know, the theory behind um, principles of courtroom testimony, how to write a medical legal report, how to handle cross-examination, and that is admixed with practical uh, experiences in simulated courtroom testimony exercises. And this is a mandatory requirement for anyone who wants to be a consultant forensic pathologist to the British Home Office in England and Wales. Uh, in other jurisdictions, it's not a mandatory requirement, but it is. it should be because one can be the best prosector in the autopsy suite and produce, uh, you know, good findings, findings which are valid. But if you cannot translate those findings into a written report that's usable for the, you know, the stakeholder who is the recipient of that report and you cannot translate um, your written report into valid oral testimony in a judicial hearing, then you will not be beneficial to the justice system. So courtroom testimony training should be part and parcel of the training in forensic pathology. So it's not just, it's a fallacy to believe that because medical doctors attain a certain, uh, you know, high level of academic, um, uh, you know, uh, attainment that they inherently have the skills and knowledge to be a uh, you know, a credible expert witness. Unfortunately, it does not work like that. And to be effective, one has to undergo formal expert witness training, formal courtroom testimony training. Now, now that's interesting that it's a policy or by nature of law that in other jurisdictions, such as United Kingdom, I think you mentioned Canada, whereby that sort of mandatory training is important. Uh, now, let's take us to the Caribbean. I mean, you, you know that in other jurisdictions, that is not mandatory. But is there, uh, is there anything that is being done in terms of your involvement or your consultancy to uh, lobby the authorities um, to have that particular expert witness training be done in, let's say, the Caribbean, uh, especially Trinidad and Tobago? So the more progressive uh, jurisdictions would recognize the need for formal courtroom testimony training. And over the years, I have, um, you know, had the privilege of interacting with many Caribbean jurisdictions. And um, in 2018, uh, I was able to basically facilitate uh, expert witness training for the staff of the St. Lucia Forensic Science uh, Laboratory. And since then, um, that was obviously pre-COVID and it was in person. And since then, we have had uh, a couple of online uh, expert witness training uh, activities. If I should just backtrack a bit, Indeed. the um, organization for which I worked in the United Kingdom, the 
Forensic Science Service, ran the mandatory expert witness training on behalf of the Home Office. And after successfully navigating that training uh, as a trainee uh, back in 2005, once I qualified as a forensic pathologist and came on board as, as a staff pathologist, uh, I was the dedicated trainer and assessor for uh, all prospective um, consultant forensic pathologists in England and Wales for three years. So when I migrated to Ottawa 11 years ago, and I took on the role as being lead trainer here for the forensic pathology component of our anatomical pathology residency program, it was fortuitous that the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada around that same time instituted courtroom testimony training for residents, postgrad trainees in anatomical pathology. So I was asked by the program director to basically uh, take up that, uh, the mantle of that responsibility. So we introduced uh, together, myself and a colleague, we introduced uh, an annual uh, program of uh, practical simulated courtroom testimony exercises, as well as every two years they get four didactic lectures. And it's on the backdrop of having done that since I think we started in 2014 that I was able to extrapolate um, that training to St. Lucia as, and as well, more recently, Belize has also uh, uh, benefited from that training. Um, it's all accredited through the uh, Faculty of Medicine of the University of Ottawa, which uh, accredits activities vicariously on behalf of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. So anyone who participates in that courtroom testimony training would receive a certificate uh, of attendance, which is accredited. Oh, that, that, that's amazing. And I'm sure we will get to, to what has been done in Trinidad and Tobago just recently. Um, now let's take a pin. We have to take a break. You're watching Shriki Legal. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Shiki Legal on WESN Content Capital. You are live um, via the, the web with Dr. Alfredo Walker of the University of Ottawa. And we are speaking about forensic pathology and uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, before the break, Dr. Walker, you were, we were discussing in terms of the front symposium or training sessions uh, that you would have um, been instrumental in, in facilitating with respect to other Caribbean jurisdictions. Um, now, now let's deal with Trinidad and Tobago. Is it that training as well has been facilitated here? Uh, in court no, with this experience? Been. Yes. No, it hasn't happened as yet. Okay, good. But of course, I recall that just recently, um, you would have, well, there would have been a symposium, a forensic, a medical legal and forensic symposium in Trinidad and Tobago on November 18th and 19th with respect to courtroom e uh, examination of bodies of evidence, trial and errors. Can you just give a brief overview of what exactly was that symposium um, about? So this was the sixth Caribbean Medical Legal and Forensic Symposium, uh, which started way back in 2016 in St. Vincent and the Grenadines uh, as the then um, annual Forensic Science Symposium of the St. Vincent and the Grenadines Medical and Bar Associations. And that basically uh, came out as a result of uh, our own Justice Katyon Waterman Lachu, who was then a member of the criminal bench of the Eastern Caribbean uh, Supreme Court Circuit, who was stationed in St. Vincent and realized that there were problems with, with forensic pathology and basically they approached the President of the Bar Association um, to provide some a forum for the facilitation of workshops. So the first three events were held in person in St. Vincent, and it grew progressively 2016, 2017, and 2018. And then in 2019, we took it uh, to St. Lucia, 
uh, because it was, you know, swelling at the at, at the seams. It was getting too big for St. Lucia, for St. Vincent. So 2019, we had a, a three-day event in St. Lucia. And in 2020, we, it should have been in person in Trinidad and Tobago, but unfortunately, COVID-19 had um, other plans. So the sixth one was held in person, as you said, on November 18th and 19th. And that is and the photos the theme, that we're seeing on the screen. Yes, the, that, that was that the conference. That's the photos yes. that you're seeing on yes. the screen. On the theme, courtroom examination of bodies of evidence, trials and errors. And this theme was specifically selected uh, because the um, impetus of this conference was to showcase the need for quality assurance in forensic pathology and uh, forensic science to ensure that miscarriages of justice do not occur from faulty science entering the criminal justice system. Um, the keynote speaker was Dr. Michael Polanen, Chief Forensic Pathologist of the Ontario Forensic Pathology Service, who spoke on the um, detrimental effects um, that uh, incompetence and lack of appropriate training in forensic pathology had on the province of Ontario back in the uh, late 90s, uh, early 2000s. And this had uh, this surrounded the work of uh, pediatric pathologists who had no forensic pathology training or certification, but ended up doing pediatric homicides, made lots of errors of uh, misinterpretation, which led to miscarriages of justice. In one case, an uncle went to jail wrongfully for 14 years wow. before the error was recognized. And, and, and of course, um, we, we've seen where, particularly in, in, in this symposium, there were numerous um, uh, legal luminaries uh, who would have participated. Um, can you just walk us through who were the luminaries, especially in Toronto, Tobago, who would have facilitated or who would have been guests in terms of either being a uh, moderator or, or being, uh, you know, basically sure, speakers? Sure, certainly. So um, the Attorney General, the Honorable um, Regional Amar Senior Counsel, uh, brought opening uh, remarks to start off the symposium. And the very first presentation was done by the Honorable Chief Justice, Ivor Archie, Order of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. And there were numerous presentations from practicing uh, senior counsels and uh, judicial luminaries, such as um, Gilbert Peterson, senior counsel. Um, there was Justice of the Court of Appeal, Alice York Suhan. Justice Katian Waterman. We had uh, Magistrate Lisa Singh Phillips representing the Chief Magistrate. We had Ms. Hassin Sheikh, Director of the uh, Public Defender's Department. Uh, Mr. Tane Pair, uh, Attorney at Law and Private Practice, uh, and a host of other presenters. And this photograph. Um, on the screen at the moment basically captures uh, the uh, some of the legal and judicial luminaries from Trinidad and Tobago who were in attendance. And the oh, that's great. And of course, I, I I know that this has been. I think this is the you said this is the first um, in Trinidad and Tobago in person. Yes. Yes. And um, and some of the feedback in terms of the participants, um, I know the participants would have included medical as well as legal um, personnel within our jurisprudence. The feedback has been tremendous. It has been great. We had a total of 175 participants, uh, 133 registrants and uh, 42 uh, speakers. And to date, this is the highest attendance thus far. Um, 2019 in St. Lucia would have been the highest, um, but however, Trinidad has exceeded that number. Yeah, Next year, we will be in Barbados, and plans are all, all, all are already uh, on the way uh, to prepare for that. And maybe you can bring the strictly legal theme to cover that event. Uh... You know, I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You, 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 you are uh, invited to attend and cover it mm -hmm. uh, at your own expense. <laughs> <laughs> That's the caveat right there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 
So we will this, this, this is a movement um, which basically wants to advance the practice of medical jurisprudence in the Caribbean. You have like-minded practitioners from all aspects of medical legal debt investigation, uh, civil litigation, whose sole purpose is to basically sensitize um, as to the limitations that exist in the different forensic science areas, uh, educate on best practices, and bring everyone together so that in each jurisdiction, we will more or less be singing from a unified hymn sheet that will best serve the interests of the judicial system for the benefit of the average man and woman. Indeed, and, and it's important to note, when I, when I reviewed the, um, the program, forensic pathology forms part of every facet in terms of every area right, of the criminal justice system, whether it be by virtue of um, uh, child protection, debts, you know, um, of course, that's being in homicide, um, as well as uh, sexual offenses, um, various areas, DNA. So it covers, I mean, it covers everything within the justice system. So therefore, it is important, of course, that our training and that, obviously, awareness uh, be given, particularly through the medical, uh, medical eye, as well as a legal eye for our practitioners, both defenders, prosecutors, as well as our judicial officers. Yes. Yes, it is. And um, Any, an, anyone who is involved uh, in the criminal justice system uh, has uh, a seat at the table. So police officers, crime scene examiners, uh, forensic pathologists, uh, uh, district medical officers who act as first medical responders to the scenes of uh, sudden and unexpected death, forensic pathologists, uh, prosecutors, criminal defense lawyers, magistrates, um, judges, anyone who has a seat at the table based on their nine to five job, their eight to four job uh, is welcome. As well as this symposium was used to basically be the official launch pad for the Caribbean Medical Legal Society, uh, which is the body of like-minded individuals who basically share this common good, and you will hear more about that as it progresses. The Caribbean Medical Legal Society will be registered as a non-governmental organization uh, in Trinidad and Tobago, and Ms. Teresa Haddad, attorney at law, is spearheading that aspect of it. And, and I'm happy that you know that there are many uh, personnel that are involved, many known legal personnel, even doctors, the police officers, you know, in, ev in every facet of our society is involved and understand the need for, for particular and meaningful reform, right, of the criminal justice system, particularly when it comes to not only detecting uh, crime, but of course ensuring that, you know, the verdict is, is correctly made um, in, in, in terms of when, when a, a suspect is tried. Because I know, as you mentioned, um, you know, someone who would have served um, a time in prison, I think it was 14 years, was wrongfully imprisoned and due yes. to the lack of, of proper expert evidence. Yes. Uh, so, Dr. Walker, I, we are out of time, so, so thank you very much. Um, just any, any closing statements that you would like to make? Uh, I just want to, you know, thank you for giving me the opportunity to highlight this very important area. Um, which is yet evolving. Um, and um, anyone who wants to get involved, um, please feel free to um, contact me. And it's what's the A.E. Walker at eorla.ca. And um, yeah, we look forward to have many more than 175 persons in Barbados in 2023. Let me quickly put that up. What, what's the email address again? So it's aewalker at eorla dot ca. aewalker at eorla dot ca. Uh, Dr. Alfredo Eugene Walker. Thank you very much. Uh, we are indeed appreciative. Thank you. 
Uh, so, guys, it's a wrap. You have been watching Strictly Legal on WESN Content Capital. Of course, you can stream us live or you can watch our replay on WESN CC as well as our podcasts at Strictly Legal with RondellDonoward.com. Before I end, I will leave you with this quote. Respect is earned. Honesty is appreciated. Trust is gained and loyalty is returned. Do have a blessed day. Take care now. Bye. Thank you.